Thank you, friends at Cornerstone, for welcoming me again. It is always great to be amongst fellow believers who take the word seriously. This is one of those letters that some people really despise. I actually met some believers who refuse to read the letters of Paul. And that's because the things that Paul writes are sometimes hard to understand. In chapter one, he made it very clear who the Messiah is and what it's all about. And now he goes on to a frontal attack about why that is the case. Uh, and he continues first why you should be in Messiah. And that's how he mainly deals with it in this uh, first section. And then he'll deal with the opponents directly, head on. And I think it is helpful for us to understand that we too need to be aware of this. First, we need to know the real deal. Who is Jesus? So that, that's what we saw in chapter one. Now in chapter two, what are the benefits? What are the things that should come out of that? A and then who are the opponents and how, how does he deal with them? Uh, now, because this is all in chapter two, it, it's a little bit hard to string this out. So I will only focus on the first 10 verses and then we'll, we'll next time see some more of the opponents because I think that'll be helpful to us. Let me pray and then we'll start. Father, give us grace and wisdom as we study this important letter from Paul. Help us to understand why some people don't like it and what to do with that. Father, give us wisdom and insight from your word. And that's our prayer over all things, that we may know him and him only. Father, may we know Jesus. We pray that in his name. Amen. Well, if you have an electronic device, turn with me to Colossians chapter 2. Or if you're old-fashioned like me and have a Bible, that's okay too. Colossians 2, verses 1 to 7. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf, and for those who are at Laodicea, and for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full measure of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Messiah himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Um, I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive arguments. For even though I am absent in the body, nevertheless, I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Messiah. Therefore, as you have received Messiah Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed, and overflowing with thanksgiving. Well, it's helpful for us to just quickly reflect on what Paul had said in chapter 1, because it is that building up of things. Now, in chapter 1, he presented Jesus. I'm a collector of coins and notes. I like them. And uh, sometimes people ask me if I could identify or spot uh, a fake. Well, sometimes I would be able to because it's so obvious. But sometimes it's really hard because the fakes are getting better and better. That's why in the treasury we have special people who are trained just to spot the fakes. Uh, the way they do that by training them is first show them the real thing over and over and over and they feel it they touch it they smell it they they remember the size the, everything about it and then they show them obvious or fake and over time uh, the fakes they show are better and better so too for us we must remember that there are fakes and flusies in amongst the body who want to present jesus but it's not the biblical Jesus. He isn't the king redeemer of our sins. Uh, he's not the image of the invisible God. He's just a created being rather than the firstborn over, not 
as the possessor over. He's the creator of all things, and he was before time. The one who holds all of us together, both the universe and us in our faith. He's the head of the body, the church, the firstborn of the permanent resurrection. And so he conquered death. And in him, and only in him, is the fullness of God. In us there was that portion. And he reconciled all things to himself. If we get that straight, even most of this, we will pick the fakes. We will pick the flusies within the body of Messiah who are walking around and going, it's about, it's about. Sometimes I'm asked to identify uh, where people or people groups are standing because they want to work with us. And the first thing I do is look at their statement of faith. And I compare it to my own. And I compare it to everything they say in Scripture. And that's how we identify the real and the not so real. Uh, we need to remember that Paul did that for us deliberately. He is the real deal. Behold him. He is what it's all about. And now Paul is going to deal with us and for us all the issues that are there. And amongst them are those opponents that are coming in. Now, th there was a plethora of opinions of who they are. But the one thing they were all consistent in is that they were believers. They had come amongst us, as he puts it differently somewhere else. These are elders who've come up in the church who are teaching the wrong thing. And some of them would be Jews. Some of them would be Gentiles. That's true. And so there is some difference in terms of their background. Some of them may be influenced by a Pharisaic background or by a philosophical background or by an, whatever background they have. The issue isn't Jew or Gentile. The issue is, are they enforcing their culture upon us? In that case, it would be wrong. Are they enforcing former false theology upon us? Uh, and, and so, friends, we can see clearly uh, within this letter, as we read through it in, in the next session, uh, that there is an influence that looks like Qumran. Uh, there is Gnostic background. Uh, I realize that Gnosticism as a full-blown faith doesn't come into the you know, real presence in the second century. But in the second century before Christ, we already see the, the seeds. In the first century, we definitely see uh, a very uh, uh, improved uh, kind of Gnosticism within the, the Jewish writings and even amongst the Greek writings. And so it's something that is coming up. Uh, there are special references to dates like Sabbaths and moons and, and that are Jewish elements. So there is a Jewish connection. But also some Gentiles who might say, hey, I like that kind of thing. Uh, we must. Now, if you want to observe something Jewish, that's fine. But the must isn't. You see, we have freedom. And that's the whole thing. Uh, some of them were mystics, uh, possibly uh, Jewish or Gentile mystics, uh, who really adored angels and messengers from angels. Uh, none of that is right. Some of it was to do with aestheticism, like oh, you, you got to restrict the body because the body is evil. It's all about the spirit. No, you see, none of those man-made rules are helpful. None of that man-made stuff is helpful for sanctification or anything. Uh, restricting the body is fine uh, if you're a glutton. But if you're not, uh, it's okay to eat and drink. Paul gives us that freedom. What you do see here, though, and that's the problem that we still have today, is Satan using various groups to attack the body of Messiah. How does he do that? Well, it's never a one-pronged approach. There's always a multi-pronged approach. Uh, some were saying, you must observe all these rules. And others were saying, we'll have no rules, no law. Uh, you must observe this food. No, no, you can eat anything. 
you, you must abstain from sexual immorality. No, 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 I can do anything because I have freedom in Christ. You see, the true reality of this is that Satan will use a multi-pronged approach. He did that then, he does so today. It's an open, direct attack on the body of Messiah. Not one way, but multi ways. Because if, if I can't catch you this way, I'm going to catch you that way. And that's why it is so important for us to keep our eyes on Jesus, not on the man-made religions. Uh, you see, Messiah wasn't openly rejected by any of those false teachers, but he was reduced no longer the supreme one, no longer the creator who existed before all time, uh, but he, he just became a created being. Uh, he was just uh, on the level of angels or messengers or intermediaries. Uh, and we can worship angels because they're pretty good too. We, we can pray to saints. You see, some of these problems still exist today in the church, and Paul has made it clear he will have no bar of this. Uh, as such, it is important for us to really realize what our faith is all about. Biblical faith is salvation by grace or through faith, uh, sorry, by grace through faith in the finished work of Jesus and only in his work. You see, rabbinic teaching was saying uh, you must keep Torah. Uh, we say this in almost all Jewish prayers. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, who has sanctified us through your commandments. But we're not sanctified through the commandments. We're sanctified by his grace. Uh, the mystery cults came in saying, uh, yes, but there's only real salvation for special knowledge holders. Uh, only they go to heaven. The rest goes to an earthly paradise. Well, those false teachers are still amongst us. Uh, the Qumran community taught salvation through Torah and community rules. And there are still churches that teach us today, uh, yes, you, you're saved by grace, but you must keep our rules. And some of them are the biggest churches around. See, uh, in verse 8, Paul will call those things the elementary principles of the world. In verse 23, he will actually say, uh, these have an appearance of wisdom in self-made religions. <clears throat> Sorry. And so it is helpful for us to always remember, for by grace you have been saved through faith. That is not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. All of us stand in the grace and so it is never about what we do or what we have done, but without, but about what Messiah has done. And that's why understanding who he is, is key. Uh, we then see Paul's aim uh, in his struggles for the church. Uh, he tells them that he's struggling for them, that their hearts may be encouraged. He's struggling for them that they may be knit together in love. He's struggling that they may attain to all the wealth that comes from knowing Messiah, having a full assurance of understanding Messiah, having a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself. You see, it is, it is about struggling that God has put within him and within us so that we collectively, not some special group, but all of us together may attain to the wealth from knowing Messiah, understanding Messiah, and having a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Messiah. Uh, as such, he tells them that he's struggling for them. And so he's encouraging them. And that's important for us. He's struggling for us, and we should be struggling for the church. That's Paul's desire. And if it's his desire, shouldn't it be the same for us? We need to encourage one another. It's important. 
it's one of the gifts encouragement uh, some of us have that spiritual gift some of us need to work on it uh, one person who had that gift was joseph the the levite from cyprus uh, better known as Barnabas, uh, Acts 4.36, thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native from Cyprus. Uh, you see, he, he was really known amongst all the disciples, amongst all the apostles, as the one who would encourage. Most of the time when most preachers will acknowledge this when we give a great message we're lo we're longing to hear well done but most of the time we'll we'll get some criticism and sometimes that's just really devastating it's good to be encouraging rather than always devastating and how do you do that how do you bring that in you see it's part and parcel of our christian faith we need to encourage one another uh, the word encouragement really means to give hope, uh, particularly drawing close to the brother or sister who is in need of hope, who is discouraged because of faith. Uh, the author of Hebrews uh, puts it this way, Hebrews 10, 23 to 25. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet one another, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. Uh, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Well, the day of the Lord is certainly drawing a lot closer today than it was back then. But he's telling us to make sure that we have hope without wavering so that we can stir one another up, encouraging one another. Well, how do you do that? How do you encourage one another? Well, one way to do that without publicly announcing it is by praying for one another. Prayer is the nerve that moves the muscle of Almighty God. I like that. I, I don't think it's entirely true. Uh, God can move independently, but I do know that sometimes God moves because we pray and he waits for us to pray. Well, how about you and I pray? We pray today and be an encouragement to one another, that we may be an encouragement and that they may be encouraged. We do it by declaring the word of the Lord. Uh, to some degree, that comes by preaching. Uh, but to some degree, uh, I've been thinking about this this week a lot. Uh, in Isaiah 6, you have the seraphim, the angelic beings who are uh, uh, crying out or, or uh, declaring to one another, holy, holy, holy. Now, what is it that they're doing? The most common answer when, when you know I look at this uh, would be, well, they're worshiping the Lord. And that's true. Let me state it again. They are declaring to one another. You see, yes, they are worshiping the Lord, but also encouraging one another by the declaration of the word. You see, proclamation of truth is key for us. That's how we encourage one another in our faith. That, that whole Hebrews passage comes back in. Because of the hope of faith we have. Uh, we encourage one another through the exercise of our spiritual gifts. And we love one another. Uh, well, Acts 15, verse 32. Uh, what we see is Judas and Silas, uh, who were themselves amongst the prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. That's the ministry of the word, the proclamation. See, that's what we are called to do. Uh, I don't believe we have prophets today, but we are to encourage and strengthen them uh, with biblical words, not just many words of psychobabble, not helpful, but with the ministry of the word. Uh, Romans 1, verses 11 to 12. 
for I long to see you that I may impart some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by one another's faith, both yours and mine. You see, when we encourage one another to partake within the body of Messiah and exercise our spiritual gift, all of us will be strengthened. All of us will be encouraged by our faith, both you and me. And that's why I'm looking forward to hearing a good report from you about what is happening in your faith amongst the believers at Cornerstone. The sharing of spiritual gift is important. It isn't about what the minister is doing. Lionel is busy enough. But his job is to make sure that you all exercise your gifts and that you may grow in that spiritual gift that you have so that we may be a mutual encouragement from one another. Uh, it's not just a New Testament thing. It, it goes all the way back to Deuteronomy where we see that encouragement with Joshua, the son of Nun, uh, who would stand before Moses. And he, Moses is to encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit the land, Deuteronomy 138. Uh, or Deuteronomy 3.28, uh, uh, but charge Joshua and encourage and strengthen him. You see that there are leaders who are called to do this. And if you're a community leader within the body of Messiah, do so. And if you're not, this is something that we can all do. We can all be encouraging to one another, all of us. We need to follow in Messiah's footstep. So why not listen to Moses? Both Moses and Messiah encourages us to take up our potential and to go for it. And they, Moses was called by God to support that next generation. Uh, encourage means to support, really. It's making sure that they can invest in the future and that they can obtain the promise that is out there for them. Uh, Nehemiah did this as well, Nehemiah 2.18. He made sure that he encouraged the people so that the people would rebuild the wall. Uh, he even underwrote some of the costs, Nehemiah 2.18. We all need encouragement from time to time, but we also need to be encouraging people. And we do that to some degree by prayer. Uh, we do this by declaring the word, by encouraging one another in all kinds of things uh, with exercises of spiritual gifts and in love. Uh, you know, it, it's easy not to be laughing but our calling is to love one another. Uh, how do you get uh, discouraged? Well, if we stop listening to the word, if we stop exercising spiritual gifts, if we stop praying for one another. You see, to put this in one sentence, take our eyes of Jesus, focus on self, focus on the world. Uh, that really is what it's, you know, the biggest problem. You see, if we focus on us, it's all about me. Well, the gospel isn't about me. I'm a recipient of that grace. Uh, but Jesus, it's overwhelming. But that's what Peter said, remember? Uh, he saw Jesus walking on water, Matthew 14, 28 to 31. Uh, Lord, if it's, if it's you, command me to come and walk on the water with you. Jesus said, come. Peter got out of the boat and he focused, he saw, no longer focusing on Jesus, but saw the wind. You can't see the wind, can you? You can see the effect of the wind. He took his eyes off Jesus. It is then that he became afraid and began to sink. Is at that point that he realizes, hang on, how do I get out of this? Lord, save me. Uh, from time to time, that'll happen to us too. Uh, we're walking with the Lord, all is great. And suddenly we realize, hang on, we're not quite focused here. We're, we're, we're a little bit off topic. 
we need to come back to the Lord. And so if you have doubt, well, that's okay. But come back. Be encouraged. That's why we walk in community. So that the community, like what Jesus did, can grab our hand and pull us up. You see, we need to ask ourselves, what are we listening to? What are we watching? What are we praying for? He was also struggling for them, he said, that they may be knit together in love. Uh, I, I really like that, you know, like knitting together as a garment. Uh, elsewhere, Peter says that we're knit together or built together as a building, uh, like bricks. Uh, bricks are inflexible, but a garment is kind of flexible. And I kind of like that idea a little bit better because some brothers and some sisters are easy to love. They're, they're positive. They're happy people. And, uh, you know, okay, so sometimes they might have a bad day, but generally they're great people and they're easy. But others are not so easy. Others are difficult. Um, you know, it made me think about the apostles and, you know, I I can just imagine Jesus would have said, church would be perfect without people. Uh, you know, remember Peter, the impetuous, quick-tempered. He had anger issues. Uh, James, uh, he, he was called the less or the younger, uh, I implying some insignificance to him. He must have felt that. Uh, Andrew was very insecure. He, he, whenever he's mentioned, he's looking for his brother Peter. John had anger issues. Lord, let's call fire down from heaven and destroy those. Nathaniel was a skeptic. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? I doubt it. Uh, Thomas the doubter. Simon the zealot. Uh, zealots were strongly opposed to the Romans, and uh, some of them were Iscari, the, the knife man or dagger man, who, who would actually kill people who worked for the Romans. And then you have Matthew, who was struggling then with a the self-image, uh, being hated because he had been a Roman tax collector. Judas, the pretender, who had pretended to love Jesus and betrayed him with a kiss. Uh, later on, we get the apostle Paul coming in too, uh, who had presided over murder. These are some of the most difficult personalities you see. Uh, Church isn't easy. It isn't filled with people like you and me, saints. Okay, saints in the making. You see, we're not yet perfected. Uh, we're perfected because of him, because of Jesus. And so that's why we need to keep our eyes on Jesus so that we can lose all of that struggle that we are struggling with and walk more in love and be more like him. You see, we are struggling together. Uh, my threat is connected with yours. And we are together, a patch on the garment that is being knit together. And we do that in love. We're struggling because he gave us that commandment to love one another. Uh, John 15, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you. And that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Uh, now, it's, it's not a new commandment to love one another. But as I have loved you is new. You see, uh, in the Old Testament, you loved your neighbor as yourself. And that's what this is based on. Uh, but that, that's only as much as you kind of want to love them. But as I have loved you. He's willing to lay down his life, and he did so for us. How much more should we? We're knit together in love because God is love. And he was willing to love us, the unlovable, to lay down his life, the life of Jesus, for a wretched like me. This kind of love is described for us so that we may know what to leave behind. Therefore, above all, keep loving one another earnestly, 1 Peter 4, 8 to 9, since love covers a multitude of sin. You see, we often don't do that. We're, we're happy to uh, be a little bit less in this. 
I, I love you as a neighbor, but we got to actually love as he loved us. And he is willing, the Apostle Paul, to struggle that we may attain all the riches. Uh, that's kind of interesting because what are the riches that are in Jesus? Uh, we could talk about, and I've already mentioned the Apostle John, so let, let's continue with him, for instance. Uh, and we could create a list of some of the things. Uh, he's given us the riches to become the sons of God. As many as received him, to them he gave them the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So it's limited to those who are in his name, who believe in his name. But it, it's an amazing gift. We've become sons and daughters of God. Uh, John three thirty six: He that believes on the Son has eternal life or everlasting life. And the wrath of God no longer abides on us. What an amazing, rich gift he's giving us here. Uh, John 18, 12. Uh, then Jesus spoke unto them, saying, I'm the light of the world. He that follows me will not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. We don't walk in darkness. We might not see everything, but we no longer walk in darkness because we have the light of life in us. As such, by his spirit, he will guide us to that light consistently. And John eleven twenty five to 26, again, reaffirms that whole thing. Whoever believes shall never die. And so if we believe in Jesus, we have that eternal life. As such, we are children of God against whom there is no wrath. We have life, of, we have light of life and eternal life. Uh, there are plenty of uh, other lists that we could go to, and they're all true, but I think it's better to stick to the letter of the Colossians, the context of this letter. He's the king, redeemer, the forgiver of sins. He's the creator revealed to us. He's our head, the head of the body. He's our leader. In him we are reconciled. It's essentially saying a whole lot, isn't it? For this gives us the full assurance of our faith. King, Redeemer, Forgiver, he's our creator, the, the originator, he's our head, and he reconciled us despite our sins. If this isn't a picture that, that we have in our head of who Jesus is, we need to re-examine our faith. You see, we have a full assurance of understanding of Messiah. And sometimes we struggle with this. We struggle with who he is and what he's done. And what I can do. And how much can I trust him? Almost every saint will acknowledge that they have struggled from time to time as they walk with the Lord. But it's okay to struggle. What we need to do is come back time and time and time again and keep looking. Who's Jesus? It's his righteousness in us. It is his peace of mind that we have trust in. When we lose our peace, uh, we've lost our focus. Uh, we need to come back. Uh, we need to do that by singing to one another. Uh, and that's, that's the key for us, by proclaiming, by encouraging. You see, those actions are important. Uh, sometimes we do lose our focus. Uh, even the Apostle Paul said that sometimes he did things that he didn't want to do, uh, Romans 7.15. See, sometimes even the Apostle Paul had to come back, and that's the same for us, come back, focus. For he's rescued us from the domain of darkness and transformed us, sorry, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. We're now part of a new kingdom. Yes, we're still sinners. Uh, we're still working out our salvation with fear and trembling, but it is what he's done. And so we walk closer and closer daily and honoring the gift giver 
Messiah Jesus. He is our Lord. It's helpful also to remember Jude. I forget the chapter, but it's verse 24. Um, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. Who's to him? Jesus. Now to Jesus, who is able to keep you from stumbling. Why? Because we walk with him. We talk with him. We sing to him. Uh, and to make us stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. See, that's that whole redemptive aspect. Why? Because he is our head, our redeemer, our king. You see, nothing can separate us from the love of God except ourselves. You see, we could walk away from God, but not if we know who he is, because then nothing can separate us from the love of God. And that's what Paul writes in Romans 8, 38 to 39. For I'm cons convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will separate us from the love of God, which is in Messiah Jesus our Lord. Nothing. What's interesting here is that Paul is using uh, Gnostic terms, uh, understanding, full knowledge, uh, as though he's ad addressing some secret truth, wisdom and knowledge. He's pushing away false Gnostic teaching, and he's saying nothing can separate us. We have a full assurance of our faith. You don't need some spiritual level to attain or some spiritual extra guide, some angelic being that will guide you. No. We have the mystery revealed. We have the true knowledge of God, God's mystery. That is Messiah himself, in whom is hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You see, he's bringing these things together. The phrase, the mysteries of God, is used very deliberately by Paul to make sure that he engages with these people who are trying to uh, come up to these, these believers here in Colossae and saying, hey, there is more, there is more. But he's saying there is no more. It is all about Jesus. Uh, the phrase, the mystery of God, uh, really would be the tweaking of the ears of these who are into mysticism, who are into Gnostic theology, special knowledge. And Paul is having none of that. Uh, he's saying, hey, uh, the word mystery, you want to understand what the mystery is? It's the indwelling Messiah, the hope of glory in each individual believer. He is already in you, indwelling in you. What more would you want? What, do you want to now pursue angels? You want to now pursue some other mystery? Come back to the head. Uh, the revealed Jesus is the treasury of all wisdom and knowledge because in him dwells the fullness of the spirit. And so if we want to understand the fullness of God, the fullness of wisdom and knowledge and understanding, we need to pursue the revealed Jesus. Elsewhere, Paul does use the, the term uh, differently and he's talking about the Gentiles have become fellow heirs of the same body, fellow partakers of the promises in Messiah Jesus through the gospel, Ephesians 3. You see, Gentiles were excluded before, but are now included. He talks about the mystery of Israel's temporary hardening. Yes, there are all of those promises out there, particularly the kingdom promises, and what happened to Israel? Uh, was God at fault in that? You see, and he talks about the mystery of Israel's temporary hardening. Uh, and it links it with the mystery of the kingdom, uh, the promise of the kingdom up to Matthew 12. It's clear that the kingdom is still among you. It's coming. But with the rejection of Jesus, Matthew 12, uh, there is a new 
program announced. And that's the program of the church, the mystery kingdom that is temporarily there until the promises that are made to Israel can be fulfilled. And then Israel's hardening will be removed. See, all of those things are hidden in Jesus. And I think that's the beauty of what Paul is writing, Colossians 2, 3. In Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Uh, the reality is outside of him there is nothing left. And that's the problem, that, that we are still trying to pursue new knowledge and new understanding. But Colossians 2, 4, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. No one. One of the difficulties is that we keep hearing sermons that are called the mysteries, the or, or keywords like that, so that we become enticed to listen. And Paul is warning us that no one deludes you with plausible arguments. It is about what Jesus has done. You see, the spirit of truth will guide us in all truth. Uh, John 16, uh, he made sure that we understand what the spirit is all about sometimes and it's it's rare these days and i'm i'm grateful for it uh, i had brothers who came up to me and said i have a word from the lord for you uh, you know and, and i'm i'm always cautious with that because the spirit of truth uh, john 16 verse 14 he will glorify Jesus, he will glorify me. You see, if it doesn't glorify Jesus, uh, it, it's a waste of time. And the Holy Spirit is not to puff me up, puff you up. He is to be the guide of all truth. And he will glorify Jesus. And if it doesn't do so, if it doesn't conform to the word as it is revealed, if it's in opposition to scripture, forget it. You see, there are lots of fanciful sermons out there, but we need to come back. Who is Jesus? Paul struggled for the Colossians, realizing that false teachers, false apostles, false prophets uh, were discussing these things amongst the Colossian Christians, and they were being persuasive with the lure of hidden, secret, mysteries, special knowledge. And Paul is saying, none of it. Don't be deceived. Keep your eye on Jesus. That's the key. Uh, Paul was absent from them. Uh, he was with them in spirit, but he hadn't really connected with them. But he wants them to be firmly rooted and build up in Jesus. So to establish them in the faith, just as you were instructed, you see, he made sure that they understood who the true one is. And that's why in chapter one, he is so strong on who Jesus is. And that's why we too must have our deep roots in the Redeemer. Therefore, we can be built up like that building that Paul Peter talked uh, in the Messiah. And if we do that, we can truly go around giving thanks. But that's the thing. Many of us are singing songs that are wonderful, but they're not good Christian songs. They're not biblically true songs. They just sound good. We need to have our roots in the Redeemer. We need to be built up in the Messiah. And then that will cause us to abound in true thanksgiving in what he has done. In verses 8 to 10, he says this, Colossians 2, 8 to 10. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Messiah. For in him the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you've been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. The philosophy 
that Paul is addressing uh, in some commentaries, it'll state, oh, this is Greek philosophy. I, I'm, I'm really not convinced that that's true. You see, philosophy is during the second temple period, and we see this in Philo, uh, the, the Jewish philosopher, and in Josephus, the Jewish historian, that they talk about philosophies, and they talk about the Jewish philosophies. Uh, Josephus, specifically in uh, the Antiquities, uh, book 18, uh, chapter 1, paragraph 2, uh, he talks about the three philosophies. Uh, Philo does the same, the philosophies of our fathers. These are Jewish philosophies, Jewish traditions, Jewish streams of thought. And Paul is having none of that. He's saying these are empty according to the tradition of man. And the tradition of man is a, a way of describing the Jewish traditions. Uh, now, let's get this straight. It would be the same if there was some Gentile influence. If this was Greek, it would still be an empty deception, a tradition of man. You see, the elementary principles of the universe or of man's philosophy or of man's theology need to be put aside. You see, it is the elementary spirits that are not helpful. Uh, Galatians 4.3, I'm thinking of, but I'll, I'll leave that. Uh, you see, these philosophies would be encouraged by fallen angels. Uh, these would be the same as the Gnostic ideas that he's combating. And he's saying, these will be futile. These will be shams. The fullness of the deity dwells in Jesus and only in him. Keep your eye on Jesus. He's not this half God, this you know, lesser deity. No, the full deity dwelt in him. And so he's, he's both addressing not just Gnosticism, but Docetism, uh, one of the other uh, philosophies that came up within the church, uh, that Jesus had no actual body. Or uh, one of the other groups that said, Jesus the man was separate from the spirit of Christ. And only at the baptism did those two collide. And at his death, they were separated again. And Paul is saying none of that have your roots in Jesus, our only Redeemer. Build one another up in the faith by encouraging one another in the Messiah. And then we can give thanks to him, for he is our King. He is our Redeemer. He is the head of our body. And in him we are reconciled. Friends, if we understand that, what is it that we want to do? Give thanks. We give thanks to our king. And at this time, as I record this, uh, we've just celebrated Christmas. We remember the king came, but he came to redeem, to forgive us of our sins. But it's the creator who stepped into humanity to become the head of a new body. And he reconciled Jew and Gentile together. Friends, if that doesn't cause you to give thanks, I don't know what will. 1 Chronicles 16 verse 8. Oh, give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds amongst the people. Friends, that's your calling and that's my calling. Friends, let's do that. Let's give thanks to the Lord for all that he's done. Call upon his name, the name of Jesus, making known his deeds, his salvation amongst the peoples. Amen. Father, give us grace to do that, Lord, to be encouraging, to declare your word, to pray for one another, to stand firm in the faith. Lord, to give thanks and to stand against empty philosophies. Father, help our eyes to be always on Jesus, nothing more and nothing less. And in his name we pray. Amen. Saints, thank you so much for allowing me to be with you. I'm looking forward to being with you again when we'll deal more with 
uh, the problems that Paul had in Colossae. And we'll deal with some of the other issues as they come along. Until then, shalom.